So hello to everyone. And let me just introduce myself for those of you who don't know me. Uh, my name is Sibylla Norris. Uh, I'm in Melbourne, Australia. And for six years from 2012 to 2018, I was on the steering committee of the Snow Leopard Network. And it was certainly my privilege to meet many of you and so many other wonderful people working with this iconic species and the people sharing its uh, remote mountain habitat. So I'm very, very pleased to be with you tonight. I'd like to introduce to you our speakers. Uh, we have Rinjan Shrestha, who is the lead specialist of the Asian Big Cats for WWF Canada. Thank you for joining us, Rinjan. We have Nadia Nidjidoric from the Snow Leopard Trust. Nadia is Conservation and Education Manager in Mongolia and currently completing her PhD on the topic that she'll be talking with us about tonight. Uh, thanks for joining us, Nadia. Lovely to see you. And is that a beautiful yurt background I see there behind you? <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. So it was a pleasure to be here. And uh, uh, here I'm uh, speaking from Mongolia and uh, I'm so excited to talk about this uh, climate change impacts on herder livelihood in Mongolia. Thanks, Nadia. And thirdly, we have Shi Xiang Ying, and she's joining us from Tibet. Uh, Xiang Ying is Executive Director of the Shanshui uh, Conservation Centre and also a PhD candidate and uh, we look forward to your talk this, uh, today. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, also with us, of course, are the two wonderful people who are making these webinars and training modules for the Snow Leopard Network possible, and what an amazing job they've been doing over the last uh, year. Uh, Justine Shanti Alexander, Executive Director of the Snow Leopard Network, uh, most of you, of course, will know Justine and Raki Karambaya, Snow Leopard Network Program Coordinator, and you'll all know Raki as well. And uh, it goes without saying they've been doing a wonderful job. I'm just in awe of the amount of work. And it seems to me every week I look into my inbox and there's another uh, tutorial, another discussion available for members of the network. It's truly, truly amazing. So I'd like to just share with you quickly a tradition that's now being embraced across Australia, and that is our welcome to country, acknowledgement of country. Uh, our huge country has over 500 different Aboriginal peoples and now the more recent people arrivals in Australia are traditionally starting events with this small acknowledgement of our First Nation people and even though we're doing a virtual event today I still wanted to share that with you and so I say I'm wishing to begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I, as a Melbourneian and all other people of Melbourne, live, and that I pay my respects this evening to their elders, past and present. Thank you very much and welcome all. So, well, didn't we choose a great week for this topic? The timing of our session, of course, coincides with this week's release of the sixth IPCC assessment report. And I know certainly in Australia, there's very little else in the media uh, being discussed than this report uh, today. 
Um, the report, as far as the headlines that I've seen, makes for very, very strong reading. Uh, and that is that in many ways, this report is actually quite different from the previous ones in that it is now taking out all language such as probably human changed impacted climate conditions. So the word probably uh, is no longer in that report. The language is very strong. We are now at a point where across the world in each of our environments, we are seeing massive changes to our climate and it is without a doubt impacted by human activities. Also, uh, the report at a very high level is telling us that certainly uh, temperatures are going to continue to rise even with our best efforts and that sadly droughts, floods and other extreme weather events uh, will become much more widespread. So with that as a background, can I ask you, Rinjan, to start us off on this evening's exploration of this very timely topic. Thanks, Evela. Thanks for a wonderful, wonderful introduction. I really like the acknowledgement uh, that you started, actually. That's uh, the good status in here in Canada. We also do the same. But Thank now you. I don't have the, the text for, for me, so I'll just start uh, my presentation. And uh, thanks to um, uh, SL Yan uh, for this opportunity uh, to interact with the uh, Snow Leopard community. It's really a good feeling uh, to be able to interact with uh, uh, our Snow Leopard uh, uh, community today. Let me share my slide. So, hello everyone. Uh, my presentation today is uh, mainly based on the work uh, uh, carried out by uh, WWF as a part of uh, climate uh, smart management planning of snow leopard landscapes under the uh, framework of USID funded project, uh, conservation and adaptation in Asia's high mountain landscape and communities. Uh, WWF launched a detailed study in, in six snow leopard landscapes, um, including uh, Bhutan, Sikkim, Eastern Nepal, uh, Karakuram Pamir, uh, Central Tian Shan, and South Kobe. And the landscapes uh, included in this study are uh, recognized as uh, priority snow leopard landscapes by this Global Snow Leopard and Ecosystem Protection Program, often referred to as a GSLEP. Five of these landscapes have areas in the range of uh, 3,000 square kilometer to 8,000 square kilometer, with an average size of nearly uh, 6,000 square kilometer. And the remaining one landscape, the South Gobi, has an est estimated habitat area of over 68,000 square kilometer. Snow leopard habitats in these uh, landscapes are characterized by uh, topographic features um, ranging from extremely rugged high alpine areas above tree line in the Himalaya and Karakoram Pamir to the high mountains and sweeping valleys of central Tian Shan to harsh desert steppe punctuated by rugged elevated mountains uh, in the South Kobe. All landscapes in uh, this series uh, shares uh, international uh, boundaries uh, and as such uh, cross-border habitats that support connectivity plays a key role to safeguard a broader snow leopard metapopulation. Uh, the result of the climate analysis uh, show that um, 
global climate change will affect all um, six landscapes as all these landscapes are expected to become warmer by mid-century which is a time period between uh, 2041 uh, to 2071. The southern landscapes, namely Eastern Nepal, uh, Sikkim and Bhutan are expected to see the rise in temperature as high as 2.6 degrees Celsius above average annual temperatures. Um, is that, uh, usually, um, especially during, uh, sorry, uh, winter, winter months. Uh, where, whereas the Mount uh, Northern landscapes, um, South Gobi and Central Tianjin, are projected to have uh, warmer summers with expected rise in temperature up to 3.5 degrees Celsius above um, baseline temperatures. With regards to precipitation, uh, monsoon in the southern landscape is likely to become heavier and there will be modest increase in pre precipitation in central Tianjin and South Kobe, where the baseline precipitation is already close to zero. The Karakram Pamir landscape, on the other hand, is projected to uh, receive um, more snowfall. Let's have a closer look at the eastern Nepal landscape. Uh, Annual mean temperature here is projected to increase uh, by as much as 2.6 degrees Celsius, mainly uh, during uh, winter months. Likewise, annual mean precipitation will be increased by um, 27 percentage, and most of which are, of course, during monsoon season. So more flooding during uh, monsoon. As a result of warming, all landscapes will experience a decrease in the length of winter season by one to three months. This slide shows a projected scenario for the eastern land, uh, landscape of Nepal. Uh, the sites shown in green, yellow, and red are the locations where the shortening of winter season is expected to occur by one, two, and three months respectively. There is a growing number of studies which have already documented the cascading effect of warming in alpine systems of Central Asia, the home of snow leopards. The key climate risks generally range from changes in ecosystem processes leading to ecosystem shifts and community structure, habitat loss and degradation from uh, permafrost melt and land use change in response to new climates. I would like to show one such scenario from uh, the eastern, uh, eastern Nepal. The, this slide shows the vulnerability of snow leopard habitats due to the shift in tree line by the year 2100 as the climate uh, gets warmer and wetter. The most vulnerable, vulnerable sites are shown in red and the moderate and less vulnerable sites are shown in blue and green respectively. Our estimates show that about 60 to 80 percent of existing snow leopard habitats would transition from a climate zone favoring alpine grasslands to a climate zone favoring forest ecosystems by the end of this century. The gradient of vulnerability in the eastern Nepal Himalayas starts from southeast of the landscape to north, uh, northwest and from low to high elevations. There is also a greater risk of disturbance by humans as the climate gets warmer and wetter. This map shows the distribution of human footprint mainly due to the land use and accessibility across the Nepal, Eastern uh, Nepal landscape. Nearly 30% of our habitat has moderate to high level of uh, human footprint shown in green and red in the, in the map. The higher human footprint is mainly concentrated in the Southwestern part of the landscape. Let me now explain the conservation implications of the analysis that I mentioned in all your uh, slides. Uh, in order to advance uh, climate integrated uh, sp spatial planning, um, maps of conservation importance and potential impacts in each landscape uh, were overlaid uh, to identify um, overall uh, risk. Conservation importance is represented by, represented by snow leopard habitat suitability and the potential uh, 
are as well as actual impacts are um, expressed by um, human footprint and climate vulnerability. In the resultant summary map, uh, the areas um, shown in um, bright green uh, represent the most uh, valuable habitats at low risk from climate change. In other words, the sites having a potential to serve as a climate change refugia for snow leopards. Areas shown in dark blue represent uh, uh, the critical conservation sites, which is essentially the important habitats at high risk from both climate and human induced impacts. I thought of adding this slide, uh, slide uh, just to highlight the uncertainties that uh, we are dealing with. And this has also been highlighted by the um, recently released IPCC 6 assessment report. And the figure uh, here it, uh, shows the increasing trend of e extreme events in terms of rainfall variability across uh, Nepal Himalayas. The dots in the map uh, represent the deviation from the mean rainfall pattern over the period between 1990 and 2030, expressed in standard deviation units. The darker and the, uh, the bigger the dots, the more variability in rainfall, which can be both excessive rainfall and prolonged uh, and intense uh, drought events. As seen in this figure, uh, there are two pockets in Nepal Himalaya that, uh, that are highly prone to the extreme events, Eastern uh, landscape. And the other pocket is in the Western landscape. Here, the West to East gradient is, uh, is, is more evident. So the increasing trend of frequency and intensity of extreme weather events would perhaps become one of the fundamental bottlenecks in identifying risks and deciding on appropriate management interventions. In recent times, a considerable degree of science and technological advances are being made uh, in, uh, and have been made uh, to address uh, this situation at the global, regional, and national scale. However, at the local scale, I believe there is a crucial need for diving deep into the prospect of indigenizing the conservation strategies as a potential way forward to secure conservation goals while safeguarding lives and livelihoods of local communities. This is particularly um, important because uh, the indigenous way of life our knowledge system has been increasingly acknowledged as the human adaptive uh, strategies evolved under the scenarios of near non-equilibrium systems, the system inherent, inherently characterized by high degree of unpredictability. A relevant example for this would be uh, the tra traditional uh, system of natural resource management being practiced in mountain communities in Nepal and elsewhere. All right, uh, that concludes my talk today. Uh, and I would like to acknowledge my former colleagues uh, whose work that I have cited in this presentation. Uh, Nikolai Sindrop for hydrospatial analysis, Jessica Forrest and Gokarna Jang Tafa for geospatial analysis, Daniel uh, Peters uh, at all of Colorado University, Ryan Bartlett of WWS for climate analysis. In Nepal, uh, government of Nepal led the climate integrated management planning work with financial and technical supports from WWF Nepal. And thanks to you all for patiently listening uh, to my, my talk. Thank you, Rinjan. And I'm sorry, I forgot to mention at the beginning that uh, we will certainly be uh, taking questions at the end of uh, all of our speakers uh, uh, talks so if you have questions however feel free to pop them into the chat or hold them off until the end um, and now i'll hand you over to nadia thank you very much nadia um thank you um Thank you, Rinjan, for an uh, interesting uh, talk. So, uh, uh, 
today, uh, uh, my topic is uh, herder, how herders perceive uh, climate change, our changing livelihood strategies in, in South Kobe, Mongolia. So my study area, it's in Mongolia in South Kobe, which is the southernmost of this uh, Mongolia and we call it South Kobe. And there is, um, um, some of you may know about this area as the Snow Leopard Long-Term Research. Um, so uh, this area is a vast combination of Rocky Mountain with some flatter steps. And uh, as some of you may aware about this coloring project we have been doing last 10 years in Tost uh, Nature Reserve. So basically this is a prime habitat of snow leopard. So in this reserve, uh, there's less than a, a hundred household lives and main livelihood income source is uh, the goat. So basically Kashmir is the main livelihood income sources. Um, so as you may aware about, there's many research happening how Mongolian climate has changes, how it's uh, going to change in the future. So for instance, uh, last five decades, we have experienced temperature increased 2.1 degrees Celsius and future it's expected to increase more and precipitation also increase in some area uh, predicted to decrease and dust storm will increase in frequency and intensity of natural hazard such as uh, like harsh winter and drought uh, will increase and uh, ultimately also this desertification distribution is more expanding or more expanding so all those changes influence this snow leopard habitat and ungulate habitat as Rinjan also explained but also it influenced the people. So uh, the main question is how the herder can adapt for such changing climate because herders are may, mainly exposed to this natural event and their main livelihood uh, income is the livestock that tightly attached with these natural resources. So we clearly see how herders are struggling to battle with this climate changes to trying to cope with this uh, changing uh, climate. So, and that's why uh, we uh, conducted an interview of research in 2016 and, uh, and what is the herder percept, how herder perceive this climate change. So, uh, so they said that temper winter temperature is uh, increased last 20 years and summer temperature decreasing, summer precipitation also decreasing and frequency of intense rain uh, increased versus drizzle rain decreases and wind speed and wind number of windy days increases and snow cover decreases. Um, so furthermore, also they expressed uh, uh, beyond these uh, few variables they were um, more narrated how this environmental uh, environment has changing last few decades. There's some seasonal changes happening and also expected to happen. And uh, some of these uh, things uh, Herder could narrate really well. Uh, some meteorological data we couldn't reveal easily like uh, area of rain coverage. Um, they said that previously we used to have this rain throughout the nature reserve. Now there's really patchy rain happening and which increased these uh, pasture competitions. So moreover, they said like length of dry period uh, increases, which also relates with this, uh, you know, wind and uh, less snow uh, experience they have in the last 20 years. And also this uh, along with those uh, climatic change, how those things impacting this pasture and like the pasture quality is decreasing and also pasture yield and biomass decreasing. At the same time, the plant composition is changing, like more weedy plant growing and uh, 
less palatable plant growing and so on. So that was uh, basically this uh, past uh, uh, experiences, uh, uh, her experiences. So let's come to this uh, current situation. What is actually happening for Gobi life and livelihood? So through this research, we got to know based on this number of livestock holding, Herder takes a different livelihood uh, uh, strategies. Like there is a different typologies we have revealed during the research. Like for instance, herders who have very few livestock left, they has to do this ninja mining uh, we called, which is illegal uh, gold mining because they couldn't really uh, sustain their livelihood with the few livestock they have left with. So at the same time, they has to do this illegal gold mining. And all of us know the mining influences snow leopard habitat in the future. So we need to find more sustainable uh, ways of uh, livelihood and rather than herder doing ninja mining. And also some of the herders who lost entire livestock for this harsh winter and droughts there has to do this contracted herder, which is a new term in Mongolia. And uh, so they are basically hired by other herders to herd their uh, someone's livestock and with their wages. And such and such uh, different strategies they have taken currently. And uh, also we, when we interview uh, in people who were a herder before, and uh, drop it as a herder. We ask it, why did you change these, you know, uh, livelihood strategies? And uh, and we we interview the contracted herders and ninja That's miners and mm -hmm. the shopkeepers, and mainly uh, they said uh, environmental and natural hazard was trigger for these uh, changes, but along with this economical and social changes. Even these political circumstances also influences uh, their uh, livelihood change strategies as well. Um, so for coming to this climate, future climate change scenarios, so we have uh, experienced nine climate change scenarios to local people. And as here I'm just uh, showing uh, three scenarios as an example. And so we have asked that if there's a less rain in summertime, what you will do? They said increase the movement and search for a better pasture. So, uh, so that will impact that reduce uh, livestock yield and health, increase the uh, pasture competitions. And another scenario was delaying an onset of the rains. Uh, they said they will delay this cashmere harvesting, which will influence consequently reduce the cashmere quality and price. And uh, uh, the last uh, scenario was a reduction in snow cover. So they said seek for alternative uh, uh, winter campsite reliable for water sources uh, because many herders uh, some of them rely on this uh, uh, snow as a uh, water source in winter time. So, uh, which also ultimately increased the competition for water sources. So, and uh, coming to the summaries, uh, so we got to know how to provide important source of knowledge about the climate change, and we could uh, potentially use their traditional knowledge as a uh, another uh, big source of the information rather relying on just on the meteorological data because they provide really nuanced and uh, um, detailed information to the scientists. And also secondly, the climate factors, which is a uh, drought and the harsh winters, which along with this economic and social factors predicted the climate change livelihood strategies for the local people. And uh, 
the lastly, all these climate scenarios which I have presented here are expected to have a negative influence to this uh, local herd. There's life and livelihood, which we can witness, uh, which has a direct influence on these pastoral practices and livelihoods. So if you are further more interested in greater detail, uh, we have published uh, those research in Climatic Change Journal recently, and also a Human Ecology Journal. And uh, so thank you so much. Thank you very much, Nadia. Very powerful presentation uh, also. Uh, and I can see some questions coming through, which we will uh, get to uh, at the end of the uh, speaker session. Uh, Xiang Ying, could I please uh, ask you to give your presentation now? Thank you. And, and thank you for all the wonderful... Oh, we can't hear you, Xiang Ying. Hello, uh, can you see me? Yeah. 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 Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, uh, hello everyone. Uh, thank you for all the wonderful pre presentations. And uh, I'm going to talk about similar uh, topic about the climate change perceptions and the adaptation of herders on the Tibetan Plateau. Uh, I think that's very interesting to be compared with the Gobi uh, herders. Um, so first, let me introduce our organization, Shenshui Conservation Center. We are a local NGO established in 2007, uh, and uh, we have been uh, working in Xinjiang Yuan area and uh, Tibet for uh, many years, especially for the snow leopard conservation. Uh, and uh, our methodology is to uh, do conservation through community conserved areas by collective governance, um, biodiversity monitoring, sustainable livelihoods, and also the management of conflicts and the climate uh, resilience. So today I'm going to talk about the Tibetan Plateau. So uh, the area is in the three river sources on the Tibetan Plateau. It's called the Sanjiang Yuan, which is the source of, um, yeah, source of Yangtze River, Yellow River and the um, Mekong River. Uh, there is also a national park built in this place and uh, the herders here still live a very traditional nomad um, grazing livelihood, um, like uh, Tibetan yaks, Tibetan sheep, and also the um, caterpillar fung fungus um, and some other livelihoods and they are very vulnerable to the climate change. Uh, first is the climate change impact to Tibetan Plateau, like uh, we have already said about uh, the impact. Um, according to the last uh, IPCC report, the average annual temperature would rise and also the uh, precipitation patterns will change with more extreme events like uh, snowstorms and uh, floods and uh, droughts. Um, so this can be a uh, serious risk for the herders and also uh, there are potential risks from the melt frost. And uh, the uh, impact for the ecological, uh, for the ecosystem is that there are might be uh, ecological degradation because the Tibetan Plateau is a high altitude and uh, arid place. Um, the climate change may ac accelerate the impairment of the grass, uh, makes the yield of herbage is decrease, and the, especially the proportion of good um, grass, uh, those um, good for livelihoods, the grass will decrease. And also there are the uh, risks of degradation of the uh, ecosystem because there will be change in the habitat of species like snow leopard. Um, and also 
also the wetlands may dry because of the climate change. And what is the link between the impact and the perception and the adaptation? Um, because climate, as we know, it's a distribution of the weather. So uh, if to this year the weather is not good, it's not meaning uh, climate change. Uh, the climate change is uh, uh, like, a, like a bigger concept for, for herders because they may perceive daily weather, but they may not think this is a climate change. Uh, and also for herders, on, um, on the plateaus, the climate is very um, ch changeable. So they already adapt to very, um, very big climate variations. So uh, how can we tell they think the climate has changed and uh, uh, when they can think that they need to change their behavior to adapt to climate change. This is my research question. Um, according to many of the theories, the perception of, and the recognition of climate change may depend on a lot of factors, like the dose response of climate variation. There need to be big enough climate uh, weather difference, and also, <laughs> Uh, there are differences in individual attributes, like their human resource, their knowledge of the uh, herding, their education level, and their social network or information. And also uh, their willingness to adapt uh, also depends on a lot of factors, like their capital of, of their wealth, their financial capital, their natural, uh, natural resource capital, and also uh, the, the local institutions. Um, so this is uh, basically framework that uh, the climate variation and perceptions, uh, they need to depend on a lot of other factors like policies, the mar market, and the household attributes. So we, we are very concerning about the natural capital and the social capital of the households because there are something we can do because when we do conservation may increase their natural capital. And uh, when we uh, help the communities, the social capital may help them to uh, go through very uh, difficult times. So we do uh, some household survey on the perception and the adaptation of others. Um, basically, I did this survey uh, Five, five years since 2017. And uh, we interviewed a lot of uh, villages through um, across Tibetan Plateau. Uh, the total number reached uh, 317, but the res result is still in analysis. So the research area is basically in the three uh, river sources. And uh, these are some results. First, uh, like what uh, uh, Nadia has already talked about the perception to temperature and the uh, precipitation. Um, I compared the real change uh, by scientific monitoring and the perception of the herders. So uh, most of the uh, herders think the summer has already been hotter. The winter also become hot, warmer which is uh, very, uh, very, which is in accordance with uh, scientific truth. Uh, but for the precipitation, we think it depends heavily on the uh, short-term climate variation. Because uh, if this year it rained a lot, we think the rain is much bigger than before. But if another year there is a variation of like less rain, they will think, oh, there are um, less rain. So I think the precipitation perception is not that accurate because it's, um, it's, uh, it's in a very big variation uh, itself. Um, but for the mountain glaciers, um, sorry, I didn't translate this part, but uh, most of the herders think the, uh, melt, the 
snow on the mountains has already reduced a lot. And also there is a rising the snow line and the tree line um, because of the climate change. You can see these two pictures with, with snow leopard and the common leopard at the same spot. This, uh, the first two picture is taken in Sanjiangyuan area and uh, the um, uh, pictures, uh, the third and the fourth pictures were taken in Tibet. So um, basically I think that the habitat of the common leopard has already um, uh, increased. So there is an overlap of these two species. So we think we should think about their um, species, uh, interspecies relations. And the perception and the impact of disasters um, is basically based on different years. Uh, you can see there were snowstorms in um, in in these five years, and the, the latest one is the 2019. Actually, we found that because of this snowstorm, um, people learned climate change because before that they think, oh, it's all same, but with a big disaster, all people think, oh, the climate is changed. We should prepare for um, potential ex ex extreme events. Um, I think this is very interesting. How long will this impact? Because their perception may just focus on the latest uh, several years. And there are also floods and the slides like last year and the droughts in between 2012 to 2017. You can see the disasters, teach, how, how disasters will teach herders to know and to learn climate change. Before 2019, there are like less people think climate has changed. But after 2019, people think, oh, a lot of uh, th people think climate has changed. And uh, after 2019, they think we need to adapt to climate change. Um, the perception, uh, we also asked about the perspective of grassland change. And uh, we think this um, perceptions depends on different areas. They are all different. And uh, because the, the, also because they have different precipitations that will influence their perceptions a lot. What is the factors and the strategy to adapt? Um, there are several uh, natural conditions that they can adapt and uh, some adaptation strategies depends on their um, vulnerability and um, their own capacity. For example, like the grassland degradation and the fragmentation by fences will uh, limit their, uh, uh, their ability to adapt. And they can, um, and uh, the natural condition also limit their uh, availability to grow hay, but they can uh, certainly do doing something by some alternatives like small reserved pastures and uh, seasonal uh, migra migration. That is very traditional way of climate uh, adaptation. And uh, now they can buy fodder and hay from the market. This is a new thing. So we did a bivariate probit model to see what capital will limit their ability to, uh, to perceive climate change and uh, adapt to climate change. Uh, very interesting is that uh, with higher annual temperature and the higher precipitation, they will more perceive the climate change more, maybe because of the big variation. And also older, less educated and the male herders know more about grazing and uh, know more about the climate change, which is opposite of what I thought. Um, because I thought education level may, may teach them about climate change. But actually, because education didn't tell about climate change, but the herders with less educated 
uh, herders, they live on the pastures. So they know the weather every day. So they know climate change more. And also I think the female uh, of the Tibetan people, they mainly stay in the tent, tending the yaks and uh, tending daily um, life. So they don't um, communicate with other um, herders or uh, like they, they don't go a lot of places. I think that's also why male may uh, be more easily to know climate change than female. I think this is also a very interesting conclusion. And then finally, the determination for adaptation strategies. I didn't find many um, significant factors, but one is that with higher precipitations, people can grow hay and uh, uh, they can do some natural solutions, but with less precipitation, they need to use money um, to buy the fodder and hay. And also they need to slaughter the livelihoods before winter to adapt to very severe winter. Uh, lastly, I would uh, talk a little bit about some adaptation practice in the cases uh, done by uh, Shanshui Conservation Center. This is not a research, but some projects. Uh, first is the natural-based solutions for climate change. So we, we, we work with communities to monitor the grassland and vegetation and the biodiversity, and also uh, encourage them to do grassland restoration, which will also increase their um, re resilience to climate change. And secondly, is the community-based uh, solutions uh, is that they can help them uh, help each other. So what first is to do a community committee to manage the whole community conserved area. So there are some non-collective uh, decisions and actions can be done by the community. Second is a community livelihood uh, livestock insurance fund. So if there are something bad happens, there are uh, a money pool that people can um, can can use the money for compensation for wildlife and uh, um, from for the lively uh, livestock predated by wildlife and also starved from snowstorm. And thirdly, the herder school, because we think the traditional knowledge and the um, cooperative management is very important. So there need to, some, to be some knowledge passed on um, to many more communities. So there are some activity like this. So lastly, the conclusion is that I think climate change has already um, changed the snow leopard habitat and the, the coexistence of the communities. I think um, the herders need to increase their natural uh, capital and also social capital in order to perceive and also adapt to climate change. And uh, for conservation implications, we think there are two ways, natural-based solutions and also community-based solutions. But of course, markets and the governments can do uh, much more about climate change adaptation. Okay, uh, that's all for my uh, presentation and thank you for your attention and feedbacks. I would acknowledge uh, all of the governments that support our work and research and also Axfam Pansara Snow Leopard Trust and the Snow Leopard Network for supporting us on the Snow Leopard conservation and also all the surveys. Thank you all. Thank you, Xianying. Many, many interesting insights and results from that study. We've had a number of questions come through and uh, I might, uh, rather than reading them out, uh, Neil, you had some questions. Would, would you like to uh, put those to the speakers, the questions you put through in the chat? Yes, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Uh, I've got a few questions. Uh, let me start with the first one. I'm gonna uh, put the camera on as well. 
Uh, the first question I'm going to put forward is to Zhang Ying. Okay, I'm going to put my camera on. Do it. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentations. Uh, I found them all very, very interesting and very thought provoking. My first question is to Zhang Ying, and it is Do you think the livelihood of herders can be sustained uh, under these difficulties of climate change? And what are the risks of climate change on the lives of snow leopards? I'll keep it on these two questions for the time being. That's for Zhang Ying. And uh, yes. Do I need to answer uh, first all? Uh, do you want to put, put yeah, all I, I, the I'll questions? put the other questions forward. So do bear with me. That was your question. Do you remember that? The next question yeah. I have is for Nadia. Uh, hello, Nadia. Uh, good afternoon from England. My question to you is, what has been the response to herder livelihood adaptations? And what more can be done to encourage sustainable local livelihoods because of the climate change? So again, what has been, what has been the response to herder livelihood adaptations? So how has that been received? And what can be done to encourage sustainable local livelihoods? It's a similar question to what I asked uh, uh, Ying. And my question to uh, Rinjin is this. What type of interventions can be encouraged at the local level? It's all similar questions, but catered to the uh, individual presentations. And uh, what interventions can be what interventions can be encouraged at the local levels and especially during the warmer months and its impact on snow leopard habitat what is the impact of these weather changes on snow leopard habitat thank you everyone my questions um Yanni, would you like to go first Yes. Um, uh, yeah, sure. I just like come come up with some ideas about the question. Actually, this is a very good question about how the livelihoods of the herders can be sustained through generations. Uh, actually, this is not only a climate change issue, but also a very uh, very difficult issue for from economic and uh, natural. Um, ecosystem factors mm, because I think uh, actually for the Tibetan Plateau, uh, although it's, it's warmer, mm, if there is more rain, I think it's better for the grassland, um, but if it's drier, uh, it may have some risks for the herders, but they can now depend on the fodder and the hay, so they there is not much problem about that part, but if uh, people rely on herder fodder and hay a lot, that is very you know depends on the financial resources they have. Um, so this is a risk. For example, for the Inner Mongolia, they may have a lot of debt because of they buying a lot of fodder. Um, another important issue for the sustained livelihood is about the young generations because in China uh, I think more young people they don't like herding they they mm -hmm. tend to uh, move to cities and uh, have another livelihood like um, becoming govern government officials or have some other jobs so uh, this is a risk for the traditional herding I think um, or the, the herding become a very new, uh, not very new, like they, they can evolve to be a high um, social status job, or maybe there will be less and less herders on the pastures. That's what we are <laughs> very 
afraid of. And uh, uh, in terms of the uh, snow leopard conservation, I think there is a risk of human wildlife conflicts. And also that's one issue I want to study next because, uh, because of the warmer um, uh, climate, there are more uh, animals to different places and people are facing new issues and uh, herders are suffering from the human wildlife conflict by prediction of their lovely uh, livestock. So there, I think there is something need to be um, in tracked by this, tackled by this issue. Um, yeah, <laughs> that's all. Thanks, Xiang Ting. Uh, Nadia? Uh, yeah, thank you, Neil, for an uh, uh, interesting question. And uh, I think uh, it will serve for uh, many other people questions as well, I guess. And uh, sorry for a very short presentation because of this lack of timing. Uh, given time was really short and we didn't really have a much elaborate uh, presentation. So in Mongolia, so as you said, ask it, what's the herd of responses for climate change? So as I have briefly uh, mentioned there, some herders doing this illegal mining uh, along with the, the tending their few livestock and some of them doing this contracted herders. And on, many of the herders also moving to these urban areas to seek for a job. And, uh, and uh, so, those are often uh, mainly the short term or coping strategies. So, and we need to find a long term sustainable way of uh, uh, livelihood for the herders. And uh, so, the first thing I think we need to support the herders in a more alternative way of livelihood income sources. And uh, which also we we trying to do here is like using this uh, livestock raw material like a wool and cashmere, how they can make a profit out of this, and and also another one of my suggestion was uh, uh, herders uh, full need to fully utilize this uh, uh, livestock. Um, as a whole, like for instance the dairy product, which is these traditions getting lost last 10 decades somehow this dairy production was getting uh you know rare and rare and i think we need to uh, reintroduce like for this young uh women herders how to do enhance this dairy production into this market so such and such uh things uh could be implemented i guess <laughs> Thank you. Uh, did you have anything else to add, Nadia, at this stage before we go to Ring Uh Yeah, I think I'm um, mostly covered what he have asked, I guess. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Ring uh, Well, um, thank you, Neil. A uh, very relevant uh, question indeed. Uh, 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 regarding um, uh, the interventions uh, at local level, uh, I think um, uh, Jiang Jiang and Nadia um, have also briefly uh, you know, touched upon it. Uh, but I would say that, um, uh, I guess, you know, like uh, as I mentioned in my uh, presentation, um, perhaps we should find uh, answers uh, in local, um, I mean, traditional uh, indigenous uh, way of life. Because um, uh, you know the, uh, the, the adaptive these are the adaptive strategies, I guess, uh, because you know the system, indigenous knowledge system or their way of life um, uh, has evolved. Uh, it's kind of an adaptive strategies um, to cope up with um, extreme events uh, because. Uh, as uh, the Alpine system is also regarded as, as I said, an, is, is a non near non-equilibrial system where, you know, uh, unpredictable weather e events uh, 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 is, is, a, is a common occurrence, uh, like, you know, uh, extreme snowfall, avalanches, uh, droughts, 
uh, prolonged uh, droughts. Uh, uh, so um, uh, they have developed uh, 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 the strategies uh, to cope up with uh, these kind of situation. And that's, for instance, um, rotational grazing practice. They, uh, uh, it's been practiced, it's been, uh, you know, uh, uh, practiced for millennia. And you see uh, there is a perfect balance between um, uh, 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 meaning, uh, wild, um, for instance, wild only population and herders because of the uh, of the system, and as well as you know, um, uh, they rotate uh, because uh, you know. Uh, so I mean, it's it's been going on actually, and also another would be, for instance, uh, 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 economic diversification. Just to relate you an example from um, uh, uh, mountain communities in Nepal, which that is where I spend most of my um, career. Uh, a single uh, household actually practices uh, three uh, different uh, kinds of um, e economic uh, uh, enterprise, uh, trade, uh, animal husbandry and agriculture. So that could also be an adaptive strategy to min because to minimize uh, risk, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, and also they have uh, like, for instance, a mixed herding system. Uh, unlike in West here, you know, uh, uh, up in the mountains or even to uh, an, an Tibetan community, community like uh, Xinjiang Jiang has just presented. You see, uh, uh, you know, uh, practicing. Sorry. Uh, Regent, can I ask? Can I just ask yes. yourself a moment? One moment. Anil. Sorry, Neil. Neil, we can't hear you. You're on mute. Um, but could I could I just, in the interest of time, I'm sorry, Neil. Um, there were a couple of other questions from. Uh, one from Sandro, and if we have time, Neil, I'd love to get back to yours. Uh, Sandro, are you still with us? Would Would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, hello, Ingen. Um My question is a little bit difficult to answer in a short time uh, during this meeting, but uh, do you have any idea about the effects which the climatic changes <clears throat> are going to exert on the distribution and the numbers of the main brain species uh, of snow leopards. Uh, I mean, you know that uh, uh, conservation of snow leopards uh, will go through availability of uh, wild prey and uh, presence of competing species. Um, so um, do you think that uh, all of them will migrate to refuge areas or uh, there will be some kind of, should I say, rearrangement uh, according to the requirements, ecological requirements um, of the species. So, you know, marmots, for example, um, may not be so easy to move from uh, one area to another area. Uh, thanks, Sandro. Very interest, uh, interesting question. Uh, um, uh, and also, as you said, it's really tough to answer because we are dealing with many uncertainties here. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the prey species, uh, uh, you know, um, like uh, the one obvious, I guess, um, uh, uh, the consequences would be uh, may, would be um, changes in their population structure because of the predation pressure uh, from um, uh, multiple uh, predators. For instance, uh, in uh, Jianjiang's um, presentation, we show that common leopard moving up. Um, uh, we don't know if they are historically there or not, but my, the, the, this kind of uh, um, you know um, observation has been is, is has been increasingly being made in Bhutan, in Nepal, and in most of the snow leopard lands. As, uh, and we know that uh, common leopard and snow leopard have a similar body sizes and perhaps will have a similar ecological or behavioral uh, requirements. Uh, so uh, the predation pressure on prey population would be would, uh, would, would go up. And I would like to recall one of your papers, Andrew, uh, from Sagarmata um, on, on Masdia, actually it was. Uh, so um, uh, 
uh, the selective predation pressure on most of juveniles uh, by snow leopard. Um, uh, how, is, is go, uh, you know, you predicted that there's going to be lots of, uh, uh, I mean, uh, 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 negative, uh, actually detrimental uh, effects on, 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 on their, uh, their, 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 their population composition. Uh, uh, regarding uh, the migration, uh, how, how would they respond to climate change? Um, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I, I really don't know, actually. Uh, so, um, uh, blue sheep, for instance, uh, based on my study in, uh, in Pu and Manang, um, I really don't see there's significant altitudinal uh, or migration in blue sheep population. During winter times, uh, uh, normally, uh, you know, uh, we see them in snow-free areas, uh, windy cliffs. Uh, so uh, I don't know if they would, uh, you know, uh, change uh, their, their, their behavior uh, in, uh, as a response to um, uh, climate change. But again, uh, we are talking about ecological time scale here. Uh, uh, so at evolutionary time scale, that might, I don't think it would be possible. Uh, uh, we are, uh, sorry, uh, so, uh, Lan, uh, Sandro, I, I, I don't think I can, uh, I, I'm able to answer your question, but this is all, you know, uh, like a speculation. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Rinjan. Thanks, Sandro. Uh, Ranjini, you had a question. Are you there? Uh, it would probably be for Nadia about uh, livestock rearing in Mongolia. Ranjini? I think she's no longer here, Sibylla. Okay, I'll, I'll read the question out. She, she asked, are there options for livelihood adaptations outside of livestock rearing in Mongolia? Uh, for you, Nadia. Okay, thank you. Um, I think uh, it's very difficult to think Mongolia as a, without a livestock and uh, pastoral practices because we having a, you know, several thousand years of uh, history of uh, having this uh, uh, livestock husbandries in, which is the main GDP of Mongolia as well. And uh, so, but because of due to this uh, changing climates, some herders, you know, giving up as a herders and trying to seek for other jobs, but which is not really being successful so far. You know, some of the people get employed in these mining companies, but just as subsequently, maybe a few months later, they couldn't qualify and, uh, you know, get mm -hmm. unemployed. So, yeah, answering to her question, it's, it's very difficult, yeah, to to find other alternatives without livestock practices. Yeah, mm. I actually uh, in Australia on the uh, the Australian Broadcasting Service, uh, uh, we had a program just a couple of weeks ago on Mongolia and the change of. Uh, lifestyle to herder communities, nomad community, communities. And it focused very much, unfortunately, on a very sad adaptive uh, response, which was, as you mentioned, Nadia, uh, quite a large number of herder families now moving to Ulaanbaatar, uh, but unfortunately, they're not really finding uh, engaging work, uh, uh, and uh, but they felt that the situation for them uh, with their traditional uh, way of life could no longer be sustained. So is that a significant uh, problem with the herder communities now? Yes, uh, it's especially after uh, 2010 and 2013 or 14, there is a, this major uh, natural uh, uh, winter hazard happened and which was really much hampered is 
uh, herders' uh, livelihood, and quite many la herders lost their entire livestock, and they mm. just uh, moved to this urban area like Lambatter and seek for a job, but many of them did not really succeed well, and uh, just uh, it's just uh, Lambatter uh, geared district areas getting more expanding with uh, all unemployed people and uh, which is also sad news and uh, mm -hmm. somehow uh, you know these NGOs even this government organization uh, needs to take some actions because uh, in Mongolia we have a lot of scientific papers even these national reports uh, released that you know how this adaptive strategies should be and given so many options and I think it's time to you know implement those uh, written documents you know rather being just on a paper and uh, and some of the suggestions are really uh, you know uh, sounded really compatible like finding reliable uh, like winter resistant uh, breeds and all these things I think it's time to test it out really yeah mm. yeah thank you for that I suppose that leads us to the point of uh, uh, where we might ask you know what as a community um, can we do and are there different approaches that we need to explore around conservation and uh, especially with uh, supporting uh, adaptations for people uh, going forward. And, you know, I, one of the things that I was thinking in my own mind was uh, the role of advocacy as scientists, as researchers, uh, what is our role to help to advocate uh, for people in these positions and uh, especially based on uh, the engagement uh, that uh, the three of you are having uh, with local people? Is there an opportunity for uh, 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 us to support uh, uh, them through different voices? Um, and I guess that I asked you uh, in the uh, prep when we were sort of having a, um, uh, a session beforehand, uh, just one question that I would like to throw in very quickly. Uh, Xiang Ying, you already mentioned what you'd like to do next uh, around uh, uh, conflict, but uh, Nadia and Rinjan, where do you see your research based on what you've done now? Where do you see your next step research? Is it still around climate? Um, it, uh, so I basically, I am more interested on this practical viewpoints, like testing out this uh, research findings and implementing the uh, those, uh, you know, findings in a particular areas. So in general, I'm more interested in this like holistic approach of conservation in practice and like how research can be uh, used the traditional knowledge as a one big source of information and how we could, you know, together to get through these uh, difficulties and like, mm, so basically, I'm also more interested in these rangeland ecologies, so, which is also one part of my... Thank you. And well. Rinjan? I'm sorry, Nadi. Thank you. Rinjan? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Um, like uh, Nadia just pins, and I would also uh, like to pursue something um, uh, which will have uh, direct management implications in assisting uh, local people uh, to adapt to the, uh, you know, ongoing widespread, for instance, uh, extreme uh, weather weather events, uh, not climate change at Bashi, but weather events, that's going to be one of the fundamental issues, I, uh, as, you know, we all uh, agree. Um, clothes, uh, drought, heat waves, forest fires. Um, mm. uh, so I think uh, it is highly relevant and urgent. Uh, 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 as the recent uh, report uh, just published a few days back in Nature Communications, 
uh, is predicted that uh, uh, about 83 million excess deaths by mostly from the mostly from the poorer regions by the end, uh, end of this century is so that's 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 as a substantial, I mean, uh, um, portion of the pop, um, pop, pop global population. So uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really a serious issue. Uh, so I believe uh, uh, this has to be, uh, you know, um, uh, addressed uh, promptly and, um, and it could be, you know, uh, and also I, I, I think in, uh, in, do, uh, in doing so as I, um, uh, mentioned earlier in my presentation, uh, uh, there is a, a, a maybe perhaps we should also uh, while while addressing this uh, you know a, a issue of, of uh, extreme events uh, uh, per se, I, maybe perhaps we could also um, try to find uh, solutions uh, uh, within the ind indigenous communities. Uh, so that could also be. Um, one of the uh, research topics that I would really like to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, pursue the nature mm -hmm. and scope, uh, scope of in the nature and scope of indigenizing uh, the contemporary uh, conservation model. Mm -hmm. So that one of the plausible, uh, I guess, one of the plausible uh, avenues to pursue. Thank you. Uh, we are still uh, getting close to time. Um, perhaps just finishing off with Yashvir. Uh, if you're still with us, Yashvir, you had a question for all three, and I agree with you. You said uh, great talks of, uh, for all three. Yashvir, would you like to finish us off with uh, your question? Um, sure, uh, Sibyl. Uh, yeah, again, uh, really nice talk. I really don't want to extend it uh, too long, but I, uh, I just wanted to know what you think, you know, because Renjan talked about uh, how the tree line uh, is, uh, you know, kind of uh, going up, or at least the con conditions for that is going. Uh, I mean, higher elevations will be maybe much more conducive for human impacts now. Uh, and uh, we know that there are uh, changes that are likely to happen to the pastures. But in terms of conflicts, uh, you know, like you know that in at least parts of Changthang in India, uh, there is an increased perception that. Uh, uh, you know, kyangs are increasing in numbers and actually degrading the pastures uh, for the Kashmir goats. Um, similarly, there are there is crop damage uh, now being reported by kyangs in areas where uh, cropping was absent till uh, you know maybe about a decade or fifteen years ago. Uh, and uh, also, so basically, land use changes um, uh, are uh, you know can be a big uh, function. Of, um, of conflict. So what is your take uh, quickly on, on how you think, uh, you know, changing climate and its impacts are actually increasing or decreasing conflicts? Who'd like to go first? Xiang Ying, would you like to go first? Just quickly so we can wrap up. Yes, uh, yes I've, I, uh, Actually, I am also thinking about this question. I think this is a very good question because uh, as the climate change, uh, there are some different, you know, uh, species migrate to different places. Like a very good example is the elephants in the Yunnan Kunming that they they going all up uh, north to Kunming city, which uh, previously they never go. And that caused a lot of uh, tension and also damage. I think um, the value and the marginal cost of the predators and the big animals should be considered that the coexistence of the uh, big species, there are cost. So people need to manage the species and also maybe there need to be some of the buffer between very big species and also the uh, local people. I think this, uh, I, I, this is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you. Nadia? Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Yashvir. It's a very interesting question. Also, it's, I was thinking it's pretty much puzzling, you know, I think uh, 
quite many of us know, it contradicts that maybe some people may ask, okay, herd are losing many livestock, which may be good for this, you know, nature and less competition with ungulates, you know, but it's very hard to just uh, justify as it is, because um, we know this local people is just uh, uh, purely really relying on these uh, livestock income sources, and we can't just, just see them as a suffering, you know. And in other, uh, other time, also, if there's a livestock losses happening by natural hazard, there is also this uh, wild angulate also suffering as well. For instance, we had recently we experienced winter has a no snow and there's a lot of uh, mountain angulates like ibex die because of this winter thirst and uh, and it was really hard to see them just on on your eyes it's just dying out because there's no water um, so it's basically look like a uh, livestock uh, you know this climate change hampering by livestock in my presentation, but at the same time, it all impacts all this wildlife as well. So I think that's what I can answer for. Yeah, thanks, Talia. And lastly, Winjun. Hey, um, uh, hi, Yasbir. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, you know, um, uh, we don't know many things here and that's, uh, that's an issue because how, how does the you know uh, the conservation obje objectives uh, and uh, people's interests would um, uh, would, 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 would coincide? I and mean, how, how how can we uh, strike a balance um, uh, between these two? Uh, it's it's been a fundamental issue for uh, for, um, for many. Uh, I mean, uh, for many years now. And uh, so, but, but it has. Uh, um, uh, but I would say uh, you know there's it's highly likely that. Uh, 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 mm, uh, it would uh, intensify. Uh, again, that uh, that is just a uh, spec speculation because uh, there are definitely, as you said, you know, Kian population uh, uh, has gone up because of the you know, um, the, um, the um, you know availability, availability increase in availability of grasses, and also now uh, Nadia mentioned that you know um, because of prolonged drought. Uh, the ibex, uh, there is a mass die-off in uh, um, uh, ibex population. Uh, so uh, there are uh, lots of unknowns here, and I guess we are playing with lots of unknowns. And as the science, uh, uh, you know, the, the matures or de develops, we would be knowing, uh, we would be in a position to uh, know uh, much better in the future. I hope. Uh, like uh, the sixth IPCC uh, assessment report, which is is, is is a much improved version, and also uh, uh, Sibila has just mentioned uh, when uh, she was introducing um, us. You know, this now we are ninety more than ninety percent is uh, certain that these weather events are 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 are, are, are for that matter climate change is is caused by humans. Uh, so this is one of the highlights. So as the science develops, I think I guess we would be mm, uh, we would put uh, more uh, certainty uh, certainty uh, 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 on this. So um, yeah, um, uh, yes, I, 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 my, my belief is that you know the, uh, the 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 conflict would intensify, but again we really have to see. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we might have to wrap it up. We've We've gone a little bit over our time. Um, gosh, thank you so much to the three of you. Um, wonderful presentations. And uh, uh, I, I, for one, feel very privileged to have been able to hear you talk uh, in depth about these, uh, these topics. Um, uh, quite worrying in many respects, but also um, that there are so many uh, people like yourselves and the communities themselves looking at, I was very keen to see how the willingness uh, to adapt to changes seem to have changed rapidly. I think it was in your presentation, Nadia, just over a few years. So 
Um, I'm sure that uh, necessity is obviously a big part of that, but um, we know that these communities are very um, uh, highly adaptive and have been for a long time. So we wish you well in your uh, endeavours. Uh, thank you very much to all of our participants uh, today. Uh, I'm sure that we'll be doing, uh, the Snow Leopard Network will be doing uh, more on climate change and uh, uh, herder community adaptations in the future. Thank you. All. Thank you so much to you all.